Hello, everyone. Welcome to June's installment of History Bites, a one hour long lunchtime conversation where we delve into the latest news, exhibitions, histories, and happenings at Guelph Museums. Today, in partnership with the Guelph Black Heritage Society and the Two Rivers Festival, we're exploring Life on the Grand, Reflections from the Black Community. My name is Val Harrison, and I'm Supervisor of Visitor Experiences at Guelph Museums. Join us on Facebook Live on the third Wednesday of every month at noon. A recording of today's History Bites will be available through the Museum Everywhere portal on our website and on our social platforms after the broadcast. Now, before I introduce and welcome our guests, I would like to focus our thoughts within an awareness and acknowledgement of the land. Guelph is situated on the ancestral homeland of the Anishinaabek people, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number, Treaty, Number 3 Treaty of 1792, the Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action and to do more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. And when we started History Bites series, the History Bites series, we spent some time in close conversation about land, its history, and its people, and we continue to build our knowledge and relationship and preservation and protection of the land and waterways. This commitment informs all that we do at the museum and includes today's conversation. And welcome Denise and Queen. Um, and so joining me today is Denise Francis, um, longtime uh, friend and uh, we've worked many years together and it's so great that we can do this. Together. I've been looking forward to this. So um, currently you are serving as the president treasurer of Guelph Black Heritage Society. Uh, she is a founding GBHS board member and has also served as secretary chair of the programming committee and on the building committee. Denise was raised in Guelph and graduated from the University of Guelph, a long-term employee of the Waterloo Catholic District School Board. She is currently the safety specialist in the Human Resource Services Department. A proud Jamaican Canadian with a passion for history and education, Denise is looking forward to the end of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 crisis, yes, um, so are, are we all at all? And so she uh, can continue her travels to learn more about Black history in Canada and abroad. Welcome, Denise. Thanks, Val. I appreciate and being here. Me. Oh, it's so good to have you here. Um, it's true, isn't it? We've been talking a long time about getting together and and um, working, uh, talking about some of our histories uh, in Guelph. So it's great to be able to do this. And Queen, um, uh, Guelph born and raised University of Guelph alumni and valedictorian graduate from the Randolph Academy for Performing Arts. Queen is living out her passions. She is a dance teacher, actor, singer, and advocate. She also owns the Queen's Co Queen Company and co-owns the Heels Academy. Within the colored communities, Queen advocates for the rights of African and Caribbean people and continuously works on activism and mentorship for her Black community. She currently is one of three holding an artistic residency with Guelph Dance 2020-2021, promoting BIPOC art and through her show, Rogers Channel 20, Diverse and Converse. Queen is the leader of the Guelph, of Guelph Black Lives Matter protest and the executive director and social justice initiative coordinator for Guelph Black Heritage and is honored to be a role model for her city. Again, thank you both for joining. Thank you so much for having us. It's always exciting to be on these history bites. I know you're you're getting to be like our star performer here, um, Queen. It's so nice to have you um, and your perspective. Always, always enlightening and um, informative, and 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 so crucial to especially because this time, um, so uh, in this period. So anyway, I'm going to. So I, I think what I wanted to do first was maybe set our scene for why and how we came to this topic and how we're going to go um, look at this um, um, uh, uh, this man who has done who did so much, but the story is not really told for the longest time. And I think that's uh, pretty, pretty fascinating. So setting the scene, 
So when um, Denise and Queen and I met a few months back to discuss collaborating in an activity that we could partner to the Two Rivers Festival, so we've, we bounced around the idea featuring stories from uh, Guelph's Black history and reflecting um, and the reflected lives and um, the river and, and stories around the river. And you both voiced the importance of focusing on celebrating, uh, reflecting and learning from the cyclical nature of these histories. And we agreed that there's truly remarkable stories of Black families in this area and we need to share them. But it was funny, we always sort of kept coming back to one name. Did you find that? Did you see? It seemed like when we talked, it, it just sort of yeah. went back and it was Richard Pierpoint. Now, this is a really old story that has, um, it's taken a while to be told in, in fullness and never probably will because some of the story is missing. But so Richard Pierpoint, uh, so this is uh, you know, 270 years old when you think of, of when he was born. He was a man known in his community as a leader, storyteller, soldier, settler. And today we might even call him, I think, a social justice advocate. Um, he was born in Bundu. Um, it's now Senegal, uh, West Africa, around 1744 is what we believe. And he was kidnapped at, a, at the age of 16 and sold into slavery. And as an adult, fought on the side of the British in the American War for Independence and um, also in the War of 1812. And he led petitions for land grants and was crucial in establishing a black settlement in the Queen's Bush. And that's an area just outside of Fergus on the banks of the Grand. And he lived to be 94 years old. But, one, but the, we have been, we've found that this is one of the almost forgotten histories of um, African settlers in this area. So to prepare, um, we read a book, A Stolen Life, Searching for Richard Pierpoint. It's uh, David and uh, Peter Mayer, and it was written in 1999. Now, before we start, um, I had pulled up a, a Heritage Moment video that really, um, well, it told a little bit about his life um, sort of in his later life. But uh, hold one moment, I'm just going to pull that up and we are going to take a look at this. I'm gonna share. Patience. <laughs> It's coming. Here we are. And when he was only 16, Richard Pierpoint was enslaved in Senegal and taken to America. All us men have sworn on this petition to fight. You're an old man. The British Army has militias and trained soldiers. I fought with the British during the American Revolution. Take your land and farm it. Leave the Americans to us. With respect, sir. I was born a free man, and I intend to die one. The officers fight for land and money. I fight for my freedom. Richard Pierpoint was one of thousands of black loyalists who won their freedom in the American Revolution. 30 years later, at the age of 68, he petitioned for an all-black unit that would defend Upper Canada during the War of 1812. There we are. Okay, so when you first saw this video, what was what was what were your thoughts on that on, on the depiction of? Oops, I better get rid of that too. There we are. Okay, better. <laughs> so, what were your thoughts? Who wants to start, Denise? Sure, I'll start. So the first thing I thought of when I watched that, it really was just a minute. Because to sum up a man's life who lived to be in his 90s, in just basically two images was, you know, they do have their minute um, timeline. But I do think the images are powerful that were chosen to see him enslaved, to see the images when he was a teenager being taken from Africa to be brought over here. And also too, towards the end of his life, when you see him there, when he, um, you know, sort of depiction with the War of 1812 and the Colored Corps. So that to me was two powerful sort of book notes to, a, to an amazing man's life. So I, that's what I think of when I see that Heritage Minute. Okay, thanks, thanks. What do you think, Queen? 
Yeah, I love that. And I think I really echo what Denise says. And what really stuck with me for that was I was born a free man and I will die one. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we talk about all this conversation around um, this momentum of this movement right now, everybody just wants that freedom. And I think they really depicted that storyline <laughs> in, as Denise said, in such a quick amount of time. Um, I wouldn't even know how to bring down his story to a minute like that. Um, mm -hmm. That was really well done in that aspect but it also makes you intrigued to know more what's the real manushka behind all of that and and each piece that leads around his life wow yeah it's it's, it's interesting um uh reading that story like listening to that it makes me and it did and i started reading up more a little bit more about the war of 1812 which you know i had a pretty sort of whitewashed storyline given to me. And just reading about um, men like Pierpoint organizing a, a color corps, fighting for more than, it, it, it was his freedom. I mean, what was better, going back to the state, if the Americans had won, I mean, all of those things, what would have been going on in, a, in his mind at that time? So I, I found it really fascinating too. Denise, we had, we were looking at a quote too. Um, there was a, a and it's, um, uh, Pure Point and later in his life uh, had uh, petitioned and I thought that was a I thought it'd be great if we could um, have you read that because it really if we didn't have that we wouldn't know about Pure Point I think I think there was a lot yeah. that had to do with um, his petition and then and then your thoughts on that then too after Okay, sure. So I'm just going to read from our new Bible, as we call it, Home on the Grand Terra. <laughs> <laughs> our our so, small book club, three of us. <laughs> so, so what is sort of interesting about this, I will sort of set the tone in that, um, you know, Richard Pierpoint, as they said in that Heritage Minute, came, uh, was taken from, uh, from what is now Senegal to um, North America, he fought in the war, uh, he settled in Niagara, and then after being in Niagara, and then the War of 1812, he wanted to go home again to, to Senegal. And so I'm just going to read about this petition that he wrote asking the town of Niagara about his, um, his desire to return home. So the petition of Richard Pierpoint, now of the town of Niagara, a man of color, a native of Africa, and an inhabitant of this province since 1780. Most humbly showeth that your excellency's petitioner is a native of Bondu in Africa, that at the age of 16 years, he was made a prisoner and sold as a slave, that he was conveyed to America about the year 1760 and sold to a British officer, that he served his majesty during the American Revolutionary War in the Corps called Butler's Rangers, and again during the late American War in a Corps of color raised on the Niagara frontier that your excellency's petitioner is now old and without property, that he finds it difficult to obtain a livelihood by his labor, that he is above all things desirous to return to his native country, that his majesty's government be graciously pleased to grant him any relief he wishes. It may be affording him that means to proceed to England and from thence to a settlement near the Gambia or Senegal rivers for whence he could return to Bondu. I know that when I read that quote, I was taken aback that after all that uh, he had done to serve this country, he had a desire to return home. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that, um, for those who haven't read the book, that that he this petition was denied. Mm -hmm. So instead of giving him the ability to transfer back and to return home, he ended up in the Queens Bush area. Was that, a, was that a fair trade-off? I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, and what I was it? Know. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, this, when I read this petition in particular, it really struck me. Um, you know, as a child of immigrants and, and, and just talking to many people in my community, and, and just not in the immigrant community, you'll hear people from out east who always say, upon retirement, I want to return home. And we have that freedom to travel and that freedom to return places if we so desire. And that basic freedom was denied to Richard Pierpoint after all he had done to serve his country in two wars, his enslavement and, and the fact that he worked so hard serving in war as a man, a senior citizen in his 60s and to have all of that and, and have your basic rights denied. 
we can't even fathom that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the fact that he was even able to write this petition, we talk about how we are trying to relate, you know, PeerPoint to our local social justice initiatives, to our current social justice initiatives. We see now that we have been fighting for freedom and fighting for our rights now for hundreds of years. The march just didn't start last year after the, you know, the murder of George Floyd and the other social justice um, injustices, I should call them. It didn't start when we had Sam Cooke in the 60s changing, talking about the change is going to come, or when we had Dr. King fighting with his soldiers and other people. So all these things have been happening for hundreds of years, and it's now that we are able to look back, reflect, and also draw the parallels between what's happening in current days and what happened 200 or 300 or 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too that Pierpoint he wished to in um, uh, to form a colored core um, mm -hmm. could have been in some assimilated into um, the, the the larger British troops, but chose to do that. That's sort of a powerful statement right there. Um, your thoughts, Queen, on on even the petition and and his, where he was and what what his desire was. I mean, you're thinking, yeah, he was a, a man in his like seventies by then, um, uh, asking to. Or, no, he was in eighties by then. But you know, what what was holding it back? What was the government? What was going on in the in the mind? Was it because they didn't have money? I don't know. Was it because all of those things? Um, and then to, to to know that that was wilderness. It wasn't just picking up and with your suitcases and moving to a new city. It was uh, a hard life being given to you. Are you muted, Queen? Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Um, <laughs> you know, it always just makes me a little sad. Like just listening to that petition and even just reflecting on last night after the vigil and reflecting on some of the moments we've had this past year. And I think like last night I had one of those moments where I was like, I am so exhausted and so tired. I'm deciding by the time I'm 60, I'm retiring and going back home. And I had that exact same thought, right? I want to go back to my connection, whether that be in JA or whether that be in Africa or whether that be wherever it brings me. There's like this calling for us to always kind of come back to home and to think in my head to be just like told no. Mm -hmm for something that is beyond just a basic right like you stole someone from their own land and all they're asking is to go back to it mm -hmm. um and and gave beyond themselves to even get that opportunity and it's it, it, it it's really comparable to kind of like this concept and conversation even around george floyd so many people are like justice justice but it took a to z to get the bare minimum. And it's almost like the same for Richard Pierpoint. He had to do all this and still only got the bare minimum. Um, am I honored and grateful that he landed in the Queen's Bush and we're now able to tell this story? Yes. Am I also sad that he was taken from an opportunity to reconnect to his home? Totally. And I think that that's what we're doing in response is answering those calls to our ancestors and bringing them back home with us. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have the opportunity to do is finish off their stories. Nice. Yeah. Um, it, it makes me think about, so we're talking about how his story resonates today. Like, um, so he, he, he had such resilience during his entire life and he had that drive. I, he never, I don't know, um, it wasn't called it at that time, but now we recognize it as such. And so seeing the parallels, um, so especially like the, the way what the, you've been working with Clean too, do you see any parallels or a continuum, a continuum of the change or, or of that, um, that social justice, just uh, more, elaborate more on what um, you've been talking about there too, because I mean, are they similar sort of different struggles? Um, uh, you know, what's your thoughts on, on that? I think, you know, similar is for sure the way to put it. Um, I cannot imagine the resilience that Richard Pierpoint needed to get through everything that he had gone through from the wars to just asking for his own freedom. And there are days that I want to give up so often within this social justice cause because it just seems like 
we make five steps forward and it's 10 steps back again. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly kind of pushing against people's idea of what, you know, um, equality should look like, what looking through an intersectional lens should look like. I think Richard Pierpoint was way ahead of his time, way beyond his time, because he was in a period of um, resistance. He was in a period of revolt. He was in a period that we're all in right now, where we feel this kind of energy and possibility for this kind of energetic, magnetic change in our world. And we can either get with it and change with it and be a part of that change, or we continue part of this kind of racially white colonial structure that we've been living in for so long that really does appease many people, I'm sure, but it's not appeasing all of our community and it doesn't actually bring us to a space of change. So I think in many ways we can relate because struggle is struggle. There's no level of comparing somebody's struggle. Um, and, and I think that yearning to want to go home is so reflective in the state of being that we are in now because so many of us are exhausted and tired and our call to response is go back home to our people. And, and so you can see that that journey happens quite frequently for our community. Um, and, and for him, I just like, he must have had, I don't know, like 10, hundreds of mentors. I don't even know, like a really good guardian angel. Like, I don't know what it was that kept him going, but it's people like him that keep me going. And, and Denise, maybe you can speak to this too, is like, it's those stories. And then the stories that are coming after us from our youth that keep us a part of the resilience in the movement. I agree with you, Queen. When I think back to, you know, as Val said in our introduction, how we were both raised in Guelph. We both were graduates of the University of Guelph. We went to high school, elementary school, whatever. And the lack of information that I found out about the Black community that is so close in our midst. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Our, our, our building, the Heritage Hall, was built in 1880. Prior to that, we had a, a wooden structure on that same lot. But yet, when we talk about history, when we learn in school, it's especially in Ontario, the history that we are taught in school is very Ontario and Quebec centric. You wouldn't even know that Western Canada existed based on that. And then the fact that it's so Ontario centric, but yet does not talk about the, the heroes that we have, not just within the Black community, the Indigenous community, and so many people who helped to settle this land. I'm almost embarrassed to say that I didn't even find out about this Pierpoint story until I was a first year university student. Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of meeting somebody on campus first year, and she was telling me about this rich history that we had in Guelph. And here I am, grew up and, and raised here. I knew nothing about it. She took me to the Heritage Hall, which at that time was the BME Church. And, and, she, and she awakened me. She awakened this knowledge and this desire to learn more about these people in our midst. And so I started to do, my, I always tell people I'm not an academic, I'm not a historian, but I'm just a person who has a passion to learn about my history and our roots. And so that's when I started my own sort of personal journey, learning about what, where, where did our community come from? Where did we go? Why, why is this history erased and not taught when it is such an important part that we should be learning about? Because Black history is not just Black history, it's truly Canadian history. And these are, these are important figures that should be recognized and taught throughout our curriculum in the schools. Mm -hmm. Denise, it's really great because, you know, we're starting, we're having these conversations right now. We've been meeting like when we met um, earlier, um, uh, with the rest of our team at the museum. I'm really excited about where we're going and um, how we're we're getting together to talk about these things because I mean, like I'm thinking, you know, Queensbush, that's our Wellington County. And we've talked about, um, it's more than just Guelph history. It's our Wellington County history, the black history um, story. And, you know, when you think of it, many of the people who settled in Queensbush um, decided and opted to come to the city, to live in the city or, or move away from Queensbush because that was only there for a few, a few years. Um, and people decided to, to leave there because it was a harsh life. But you know, I always, I'm thinking too, when, when Pierpoint first went there, um, it was almost like an equal playing field because all the settlers that were there had to depend on each other 
to get by in many respects. And they, there are quotes, I'm reading quotes in the, the book that, that say that too, that there, there, was, uh, there were many people that settled and um, because of, uh, you needed your neighbor, you needed your community. And I thought, wow, that's, um, we need more of that. Although it was a harsh life and it was um, not the way, say, Pierpoint or um, anybody who, uh, you know, settling a land is not an easy thing. And, um, and you know, we can get a, all the talks about, you know, what we're doing for the land and how that was. But, but I, I was thinking back on that and how that story sort of unfolds of, of community, but then a breakdown of, of ways. And, and um, I don't know, it's just, just um, so much of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was um, I was thinking um, along those lines of a uh, queen when um, when we we look at um, sort of the, that history and actually I'm going to put you at both so with sort of that that white the, the history of the white settlers sort of is, it's a fraught with um, um, the way we talk about history and is going through like we're it's sort of a there's a reckoning going on right now so about black uh, black settlers often uh, they had a, a, a different experience. Right, just in along those lines, uh, than their white counterparts, and uh, we're settlers for different reasons. So, how do you fit the story of Black people settling the area within the broader conversation about the history of col uh, colonialization and the settling of Canada? Um, so, again, with Richard Pierpoint's uh, talk, um, our request to go home. Do you see? Are you? I know um, Denise, you were just talking about that of learning more history, um, uh, celebrating, recognizing, telling stories. This is this is what we're. I sort of thought we needed our conversation today is because here's one story that we need to tell, and this is just the you know tip of the iceberg of stories that we could tell. Um, so, any thoughts on that? I'd like to start queen um yeah i think you know when we look at this kind of conversation about settler life um uh, even denise had brought this up you know heritage hall and what we knew as the bme church before was long standing before the incorporation of guelph before we knew even who john galt was or before we even talk about this kind of eradication of black and indigenous bodies out out of what we know as guelph now um even if we're talking about you know Pierpoint and um them offering up land to him whose land were they offering to him <laughs> like it's that conversation that they were offering land that didn't belong to theirs in the first place and while we are so grateful to our indigenous brothers and sisters for the safety net that we have um we now have as heritage hall and um what we know as some of the queen's bush it wasn't our land either we have to also recognize that we're we're settlers in our own ways too and and the ways that we can um reconcile those communities and i think you know especially this year that we're seeing that happen is our indigenous and black communities coming together because we all have the same struggle against white violence and white colonialism and um uh and the political powers that have been in charge for so long and making choices for us and even the conversation that we have now about history bites and these kinds of things, we're constantly searching because history was always written by the victors and the victors tended to be white males of power. And so we're trying to constantly search for these answers, you know, even our indigenous communities, there's so many of them that had no idea they were indigenous because of that disconnection. Mm -hmm. um, and I am so thankful for these stories and I'm the same way, I'm embarrassed to think that it didn't, it was until I came back from Toronto in my late years and getting connected to Denise and the Guelph Black Heritage that I even had this understanding of what Guelph could mean for my ancestors. Um, so I think that there's a big part there that we also have to, one, give recognition in the way that we are settlers, um, but also two, hold homage to the Queen's Bush and, and um, what that represents for our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking too when um, we're talking about knowing our histories and, and not and, and those histories that are that have sort of been um, that word came up erased, right? Um, or almost, and that's what we're trying. Uh, this is where this is the steps we're taking, right? I think these are these are important things that we're doing right now in this time where um, I know my, my story, like the story of um, a black uh, lives in Guelph. 
it's the same, Denise I, and and Queen. I too, it wasn't, and I was in the museum. Like they're right there, shows you what was happening, right? The stories that we were telling, and um, it was in. And I've been around the museum a long time, so and and I, and I met David and Peter when they were doing their book signing. This book actually signed by them. So it was that, that's when, yeah, there we are. So um, <laughs> I, 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 at that time, that was a, an awakening for, for me as well. It's like, what the, you know, this is, this is crazy that this, these types of stories, which are pretty fascinating. This man lived to be 94 years old and did amazing things in that time. And, um, and now we, we're finding out more. And this is, this is what we're going to be doing, is working more to tell these stories. Because I think of, of the families in Guelph, right? the um the Bolins, the the sticklands i mean i'm thinking of the histories that i learned like when we we first started um in in 99 with the black um uh, story in guelph and wellington county when we did an exhibit at that time and and some of the families um the jewels melville was great as um a, a source for for information and so many other names of families in this community and some of them reaching back into the queensbush area so i'm um, um there's there's so much that we we um, we can go forward with. Um, I was just I'm looking at a couple of binders that I have on my desk too of the work that uh, Melda uh, Jewell and Mary McLean did in putting um, uh, paper uh, newspaper clippings and everything together um, with that. So it's sort of exciting to see that there's more stories. So it's just making me explore more. So I want to show you a couple of pictures. I had um, visited the area in Fergus that was Pierpoint's land. So I want to show you some pictures. Uh, there are some markers. This, now this is again like, how do we recognize? How do we celebrate? Um, this is one of the ways that, and just again, um, a small way that can be done. So I'm going to share my screen again with some pictures, okay? And then this is going to lead us into conversations about how do we how do we go about finding these stories, celebrating them, telling them, sharing them, recognizing them, okay? So pull this up. Let's see if we can. And here, okay, I'm gonna, okay, can you see that okay? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna make, actually, I'll put the screen full. So this is um, uh, in Fergus, out, just outside of Fergus, the east side of Fergus. Uh, I, and, and this is John Black School. And I'm looking, this picture is looking towards the river. See, in the middle of that picture, there's some houses in the far distance across the road. The river is just beyond that. This is Richard Pierpoint. This is where his land was. So imagine bush and, and um, small log cabin and, and everything. But this is looking from John Black School. There's the flagpole and then to the right is a stone. Can you see that? Okay, and I am going to, I want to, this is the plaque that's there. And I won't read it, um, but it, it tells the story of him coming, um, being stolen from um, his home and the War of 1812 and, um, and how he was, he came to this land. Okay, so that's, that was um, where the recognition, and it was uh, David and Peter who were, um, they, they worked hard to get this plaque put at the school. There is, and then I got back in my car and just, I probably could have walked, it's probably, it wasn't that far, but around the corner, um, and this is sort of right at the edge of his, where his property would have been, it's Pier Point Park. So this plaque, this needs some work done on it, but um, it's nice um, uh, that the Wellington County Museum and Archives recognized and, and supported the, uh, this park. And so this is a bit of information again on Pier Point. And then I hope I've gotten going in the right direction here because I have, yeah. So this is, um, this would have been the edge of his land. This is the river, um, Granite River that um, runs through his property. In the distance, you see some fly fishing people there. But that's his land. That's, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, a, a nice little walk. The park is, is great. It's a little um, a hike uh, to, the, to the place. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop that. So. It was really nice. It was a beautiful day and it, it is just gorgeous. Have you guys had the chance yet? We'll have to take you out there sometime. We'll go for a walk, a hike along the river. Are you fisher people? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think of, you know, that's that's a sub, when he was there. <laughs> no, no, I'm Denise. <laughs> okay. so, um, I, anybody who knows me knows that anything to do with the outdoors, I'm 
I'm so happy to look at it from the safety of my heart. <laughs> okay, so you like just this picture was good then. <laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, if I've been there, it has been many years, I have to admit. Wow. And uh, one of the things I was telling Queen about this summer, I would really love to do, there's going to be limited options for us, you know, because I anticipate the COVID crisis still continuing on, is to go around and explore Ontario. There are so many historic sites that are uh, affiliated with the Black community, from Niagara all the way up to the Windsor area and there and we need to explore these areas that are in our backyard um, one of the things I have to admit that was sort of disappointing in your pictures was to look at the state of those plaques mm -hmm. for such a hero and important figure in our community a little bit more could be done to ensure that those plaques are kept up in a, a good condition a good standard because they're hard to read at this point and, mm -hmm. I, and it's a shame to say I think they've been like that for a little bit now and uh, and I think as a community, what are we doing to honor our heroes? And and a hero deserves recognition in a way that is that is beautiful and well maintained and well kept. That's just my own personal thoughts. That was well, my thought. Part. Yeah. Well, and go ahead. I, clean up. And when I also think too about these stories of our Black community, you know, growing up in Guelph, Guelph was so you know closely identified to the Italian community. And as Queens mentioned earlier, the Black community was here prior to Guelph being Guelph, prior to John Galt. But yet, when we talk about the concept of absence and erasure, people do not think of Guelph and the Black community, even though we have this long-standing history of well over 100 years. We think of the Italian community and all the settlers who, who came after us. And then we have to sort of examine, why did we leave? Were we forced out? Did we go of our own volition? And where did we go? And also too, I'd like to know, why are we coming back? Is it just affordable housing or is it because that we wanna reconnect with the with the history and our past with our community? Coming home. And Coming uh, there are so many questions that we really can be asking about this. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot to think about. It, it's gonna take up more than an hour just to answer that one question or even talk about it. But there's so many things to talk about with the local black history here in Guelph, Wellington. So. Mm -hmm. so Queen, what sort of stories would you like to see uncovered? I don't explored? know. That, that really made me want to, like, we need to rebuild that cabin. <laughs> like, it just makes <laughs> me want to, like, take back our land and, like, have these areas where we can really give honor, not only to Richard Pierpoint, but, like, the many people that came with him, you know, um, while he, I'm, I'm pretty sure he did not have kin of his own. Mm -hmm. um, that we're aware of, right? The story is right? not fully told. There's so much. And I, I almost hate calling it erasure, maybe like whiteout. Maybe whiteout's even a better oh. word for it because <laughs> I feel true. like whiteout, we can just scratch off and find the surface underneath because the stories are there. We saw it with Richard Pierpoint. We've seen the work people like Cheryl Fogo have done on um, John Ware. And like that, that research was immense. But then eventually she started digging up all this history. The same work of Ingrid Waldron's doing out east with our Black community and Indigenous community with the environmental racism. Like it does take that research project, but mm -hmm. then you realize these stories are somewhere there. It took someone to do this research about Re Richard Pierpoint to get us here. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that we can kind of continue that story. I want to hear about the brothers and the sisters we haven't heard of. I want to hear about our ancestry line that, you know, dates all the way to the Heritage Hall. Who were those people laying the bricks? Who were those stone quarry men who probably laid the bricks to Church of Our Lady, that probably First Baptist, to almost all of these churches that have this history? Um, those are the stories. Each person is a hero to me in, in this kind of conversation because they were part of our full story as a whole, as a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, thinking of the stories and the shared stories and where they where they're located, because you know, Pierpoint's land was that crossover from from people heading from Dundas up to places like Collingwood, No One Sound. They'd stop in, at, and and so you know, there's 
I, I, in, in the book, I was reading that um, in, in Owen Sound, they, they researched with um, family members up in Owen Sound of, of recollections of pure point in his storytelling. And wow, that's that's amazing. Like where uh, that that was captured. Now that's again another little snippet of pure point that we would have not not known otherwise because uh, he didn't write right. His storytelling was what um, and people's recollections of meeting him and calling him Paw Point or um, Captain Dick or all of those names. And and then that right there, that's a, a respect thing too, right? He's a captain. He was he his rank was never at that level, um, but but was recognized as one of a, of a leader and that those stories are missed. And so I'm, and it's, it just makes me think of, yeah, what all the other things that we're missing, what we need to pull together to go forward. Um, so, um, so there's, there's like, th those are the stories that, that we can work towards. So anyway, I was thinking we're, I, we're, we're, we're doing, what have we missed? What have we missed in our storytelling about peer point that we've not talked about? Can you think of, um, We've covered a lot, but is there anything else that pops out at you? Um, we have covered a lot, but then at, at the same time, I think we haven't really said too much because this is a man that had such a fascinating life, lived to be in his 90s. I'm just looking at those pictures of modern day Fergus and I'm thinking as myself, you know, 20, 30 years from now as a senior citizen, can I go there and work the land, clear the land? the amount of strength and resilience that he had. Mm -hmm. And especially too, when you think about the emotional dejection he must have felt when his petition was denied and he ended up in that area in the first place, mm -hmm. all those things that he was dealing with, with the emotions. Another thing I also think about too, is that uh, Richard Pierpoint was not alone in this community. Who was there with him? And I think there's so many more untold stories that we need to uncover about our black community in Guelph and Wellington. And um, and I'm also, I'm excited. Uh, for a while I was, like I said, I, I was embarrassed that I knew so little about the black community, but, I'm, but I also have hope because over the past 10 years, I've seen people at the University of Guelph. I've seen Professor Jade Ferguson. I've seen mm -hmm. the students do their research with things with their mm -hmm. black past in Guelph website. So our young people, and our older people too, and middle-aged like myself are excited. <laughs> we are fascinated and people out there, they're doing the work, they're sharing their stories, they're sharing our resources, their resources. And so hopefully the next generation, when we talk about these names, it'll be commonplace for them. They won't have to go and do some research and find an obscure book or, 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 or look someplace and find out Richard Pierpoint and all these other names that are that are commonplace, the Bolins, the Sticklins, the Jewels, those names will be a commonplace in Black history when we talk about Guelph, Guelph and Wellington. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So I think, I mean, we've we've got, we've been talking um, um, about, I think it's the stories, like it's where we're going from now and from here. I mean, this, this has sort of got our, our thoughts going on on what we've been missing. And you're right, Denise, you're, we we scratched the surface on him. I mean, it makes us ask about. Um, so, what was the involvement of of the African slave? But, and it was they were free. Like they were they were coming to this area, hopeful in a hoping in a better life. But is it the, was it the lesser of two evils? Right? <laughs> you know, which which do I choose? I'm going to fight um, and do this, or or um, uh, do nothing, or or, or it, there's just a, the, the mindset and how how things played out because pure point I mean he was at every turn um, denied but just had the fortitude and um, and resilience and um, now in, in the end was it a resignation that um, I'm going to live my life now okay my last hope was that I could go home but my life now is with my community in Niagara and my clearing of the land in the Queen's Bush um, you know that's that's a that's a sad part of the story but it was his story that starting now the histories that we're looking at and exploring now and who the people are that are, are here today so and and what's what's the story so um i mean there's the there's so many ways of looking at this so true yeah. there's i think so many angles to go from and richard pierpoint is just you know such a good 
starting place to getting your imagination going on how many other stories that there could possibly be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we were originally talking about the idea of, of um, stories on the grand and all of the stories we could tell, again, I think it was like, oh my God, there's so many stories. And then we brought, like I'm sort of taking it around full circle now, we brought it back to Pierpoint. That's a good starting point. Um, uh, he chose, and his life was all about water, all about land, all about um, place and where was his place and where he felt comfortable. And, and um, to have these pieces of land awarded to him, but then the backbreaking work that's needed to, to um, accomplish that, the community he drew on and who was that community and, and, um, and to do this over and over and over again. Um, the, it's, there's just the story of resilience is huge and, and um, living in this community uh, and um, making it the way it is today a lot. But we need to know more about the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any last thoughts, my two book club buddies? <laughs> <laughs> I think he summed it up quite well in that uh, you and Queen uh, Val, in that this is just the beginning. There are so many stories that we have about our community. And I think I'd like to encourage people to go out and explore. Take that trip to Fergus. It's not going to take you very long from Guelph. And go and look at the plaque. Go and look and try and imagine what it was like uh, somebody in their 60s out there give, being given this land by the river. How would you have imagined clearing it? Think about the about what he went through and what he was feeling like standing on these steps standing on this land and we have to give praise and thanks to our indigenous family for granting us this land and providing this land for us and to also think about where are we now and where are we going so we always I always like to think of it's we we aren't living in the past we need to honor our past and we need to celebrate today but we also need to look towards our future too and we have such a rich history and we have so many young people like Queen who are passionate and sharing our stories and taking it on for the next generation. Wow. Well said, Denise. Do you know what? Your passion comes through all the time. I'm just I'm always amazed, um, inspired by the work that um, the Guelph Black Heritage Society is doing because um, uh, you're you're making a mark. You guys are are doing amazing things and looking at our history and going into the future. So I think you got it. Well done. Yeah, and well said. Queen. I don't know how I can possibly follow. <laughs> um, everything was so well said there. And I think that that's exactly what we want to keep doing is encouraging people to explore, encouraging people to continue educating themselves. There's just so many stories out there. Um, and, and encouraging people to continue getting uncomfortable with some of those mm -hmm. stories as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so much of what this kind of brings up for people, not just the black community can be a hard conversation, but get comfortable with being uncomfortable so that we can um, tell these stories again, get these voices heard. Even like, I think about Fergus, like that was a black settlement. And now that's not what we look at Fergus today. <laughs> so I, I think it's just like really open your eyes to what more that we can be outside of just like this Italian history or whatever history that you were taught in your schools. And then and then petition and do the work that's outside of just us taking the weight of doing all the code of anti-racism work and education. We all need to do more um, so that we can make this a better community as a whole. Mm -hmm. Again, well said. Well, um, you know, that's, that's true, Queen. <clears throat> when you think of Fergus, that was 1,500 people, Black settlers in that area that formed a community. It was there and it's gone. And where did people go? Some to Guelph, some people did, but other people went back ho home to where they thought maybe it was going to be better when they go into back to the States or back to Niagara or 
from heading up to Collingwood or, or um, all the different areas that, that people sort of disperse to. But um, you're right, it's, it's the stories we need to um, uh, keep track of. And it's all of us, you're right. It's our museum, um, it's the work that we're doing in partnership. I'm just loving that, that um, we can work together to find those more stories. P knowing that people, that they're, yes, share your stories. If you know that there's some great history in your background, share it with people, because that's how we get the word out. Right, it's um, it's how we it, it's all of us sharing. So and uh, and giving voice. So um, this has been a great session. I've really appreciated this. I love talking to you too, both because <laughs> um, uh, you inspire me to to uh, become better and do better and um, uh, and find those stories. Uh, it's it's always um, yeah. There's a, you're right. It sometimes it's uncomfortable and it should be because. Um, that's how we get going and we go forward. Uh, so I really appreciate, um, I thought this was a great conversation too, like in that the history, right? Um, Pierpoint, uh, it opens it up to a lot of different um, ways of, of telling our story. So um, I really appreciate that you are here for our History Bites session and um, hope we can do more like this. I think I see these types of storytelling um, with us and sharing these stories as, as a, a great way to go forward. And I like the idea of encouraging our, our youth to, to um, explore more too. So I think all, all in all, I think um, we're, we're, heading, we're heading in the right direction, I think. I'm very positive. I've always been positive about that. And, and Denise, how, how many times did we say, we've got to do this, we've got to sit down and get going forward. And, and then we have our busy lives, right? But this is, this is we're doing it. Yeah, I appreciate you inviting uh, Queen and I to participate today. Um, the GBHS and the museums have had a long-standing relationship uh, for almost a decade now, and we really appreciate the support. And we look forward to working together on some future projects too. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Denise. Yeah. Thanks, Queen. Thanks, Thanks for having me back again for another history. <laughs> A pleasure to sit down and I'm really appreciative of the way that the museum has been um, working on recognizing and re reconciliation and um, just value. I always bring my spirits up. So it's always. <laughs> Back at you. Have to Excellent. Book, book club. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Find another. Which was our next one? I have, I have to, to do this. <laughs> do you have any time to read books, you two? I just. I was just like, I don't know when. <laughs> okay. We find, you know what, this is a passion project for both of us. So it's amazing how we find time to do what we want to do. And these things that really, I always tell people, these are the things that feed our soul. We have jobs that help provide for our basic needs, like our housing and our food. But in order to uh, to help us emotionally, mentally, and with as our, and feed our soul, these are the type of projects that we'd like to do and engage in. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to many, many more long years of, of working together with you both and the end of the, uh, GB, the Guelph uh, Black Heritage Society and um, lots of new people in the community, too. I think this is going to open it up that people feel like they want to come and share. So I'm looking forward to that. So and I know it is. It's happening. It's happening now. So. Anyway, I will um, I guess we'll sign off now and um, and we'll see you next sitting. And again, I, I, it was funny, I didn't feel like I really needed to do um, an introduction to you two because you are so well known in the community, um, but uh, always, always good to, to um, back you up. You have uh, amazing backgrounds, um, all the work that you do. Inspiring, as I said, and keep going, doing all the great things that you're doing, and we will see you. Thanks so much. All right, take care. <laughs>